My name is Kamal Bob. I am the global lead for diversity strategy and research here at Google. The discussion today is about race and education and the future of a modern technopolis. In order to get into that uh, conversation, it's important to understand the moment that we're currently in. Obviously, the nation here in the United States and in the world is in uh, flux. Uh, particularly in the United States, it's relevant to reflect a little bit on how we got to the moment that we're in. We are in a moment of the conflation of a COVID pandemic and a social uprising inspired by the killing of George Floyd. But in order to get into race and education, uh, we do have to pan back just a bit uh, and think about the ideological uh, transition that the country is in. However you might feel about those things, the reality is that we've gone through national trauma. In the beginning, uh, at the shift of these two ideologies, uh, there was, if you recall, the Women's March. It was the largest demonstration in American history. And it was revealing a certain kind of angst about the ideology that we're currently under. That was followed almost immediately by an immigration debacle that led to uprisings in airports all across the country. Uh, and the ban from Muslim, uh, from immigrants coming from certain Muslim countries. We were followed that with the government shutdown, which was again, the longest in the history of the country. And then there was the impeachment. And all the while there was the angst uh, dealing with racial discord and animus. The Charlottesville uh, demonstration led to a time where people who are my age I was born four years after Martin Luther King was assassinated. People who were my age having to contend with words like the Ku Klux Klan and Nazi-affiliated organizations. Uh, for people, again, in my generation, those things are artifacts of history, but we had to contend with them in real time. And then ultimately, here we are in this COVID-19 global pandemic and all of the trauma that that's put the country under. And in the midst of that, we had to confront the killing of George Floyd, which has sent us all into what I would call an American spring. So discussing race and education and ultimately what a modern technopolis is, it would be uh, incomplete for us to try to do that without understanding, at least contemplating the effects of the moment that we're in. So relative to uh, those two things, race and education, the pre-existing conditions idea is obviously part of the lexicon now because we're talking about a global pandemic and the disproportionate impacts that it has with people who have pre-existing conditions. The same is true in education. And one of the principal pre-existing conditions that we're dealing with in at least the United States education is segregation, racial segregation specifically. And again, here too, we have to be mindful of the fact that we're not talking about racial segregation in 1954, previously, we're talking about it today, here in 2020. If you recall, 1954 was Brown versus Board of Education, where we decided as a country that uh, legalized racial segregation in schools in America was illegal. Uh, separate is, in fact, and inherently unequal. But here we are today. Uh, I'll use Atlanta, where I live, as an example to demonstrate the degree of racial segregation that we currently operate under. And this is by no means special to Atlanta. Atlanta happens to be one of the top two most segregated cities in the United States. Uh, and this graph, uh, crudely, what it shows is that in the colors that are dark and gray and black, that's the predominantly black section of the city. And those that are white are the predominantly white sections of the city. And that segregation is nearly absolute. And it correlates with everything, with the quality of education, with the quality of public service, and in this current moment of social upheaval, it correlates with the kind and quality of interaction with the police. Whether you get garbage picked up, it certainly correlates with the voting patterns that we see here in the city. But to make it even more clear relative to education, I think it's important for us to consider how this actually plays out. And certainly for those of us who live in the United States and have children, you know what this is like in the schools and communities in which you live. These, uh, the names here are immaterial, but these are basically the 11 traditional public high schools in Atlanta. And all I wanna illustrate here is that in essentially eight of those schools, there are virtually no white students at all. 
and all of the students in the entire Atlanta public school system essentially attend free schools. So it would be in fact true if we put a sign here that said, these eight schools are for blacks only. And hearkening back to a previous time, those kinds of things are egregious to our sensibilities here in the middle of the 21st century. But this is the reality. And even in the schools where white students attend, those schools within them are also segregated, such that the white students have better access to the advanced placement courses, to the honors courses, to the international baccalaureate courses. And in this instance, I've been to all of these schools personally. So these are not, uh, it's not secondhand information. I know, uh, in fact, in part because of my role at Georgia Tech, I understand how this works. So this is the, the street level reality of the relationship between race and education. We're essentially still living in two totally bifurcated systems with two different sets of expectations about what education means, about what education is offered to one group of students versus the other. And clearly that limits their ability to participate when they move into the post-secondary world. To demonstrate that even further, at the Georgia Tech College of Computing, I'm using Georgia Tech as an example because I'm on the faculty there as well. I, I, I'm the senior director of the Constellation Center for Equity and Computing. So I'm speaking on behalf here of information that I know well. Ultimately, what we've seen over the last uh, decade and some is that the, the fraction of Black and Latinx students who have been admitted into the College of Computing has only increased incrementally. Uh, but for Asian and white students, as you can see here, there's been a significant increase, uh, principally for Asian students, as you can see, that uh, increase is dramatic. But what that is an indication of is the basic infrastructure that is segregated, which is the pre-existing condition that limits students' opportunity to be able to play in this higher level. And that indicates, of course, and brings us to the idea of what a modern technopolis is. And in my construction of this uh, term, when cities like Atlanta, like Chicago, like uh, the Bay Area, Oakland, New York, uh, Raleigh, Durham, and the Research Triangle Park, they have built economic development strategies that are premised on the idea that tech companies will show up in their country, in their uh, regions, and drive the economy forward. And that is a, a reasonable expectation, particularly given the disproportionate positive impacts to economies that tech companies have. But what does that do? It requires a certain skill set. So when companies, not unlike Google, are planning for where these uh, locations should be, they do an assessment of the workforce and the workforce's capabilities in those places. And in the current uh, kind of, we're, we're sneaking up on the end of the first quarter of the 21st uh, century. And this is, this is news and uh, language that we all know. Uh, what are 21st century skills? What is the promise of a modern technopolis? The promise is that we will have people who have computational skills, who have technical skills, who have the wherewithal to be able to participate in this modern economy in some way. And that's a range from people who are software engineers and advanced computationalists, to those who can use basic analytical and numerical skills to participate in whatever industry, whether it be art, cultural generation, service industries, gig economies, etc. So we have to agree that there is some certain level of numeracy and analytical skills and technical skills that make people able to participate in what I call a modern technopolis. So the challenge here, of course, is that if we're thinking about what citizenship means in that space, and here I don't mean citizenship in the litigious sense of who is legally able to qualify to be a citizen, but rather citizenship in the sense of mutual responsibility and the, and the ability to be viable, to be meaningful, to be present, and to have a, a, a means of contributing in this modern technopolis, in this modern economy. In order to do that, you have to have the aforementioned skills. But because the segregation is so virulent, and what it does is it constrains the opportunity of certain sections of these cities to be able to participate. In the case of Atlanta, what I was alluding to, to make this case ultimately, is that we already know 
that black students in the public school system in Atlanta, for example, are segregated in ways that lock them out of their ability to participate, to get the access to higher ed institutions like Georgia Tech, like Stanford, like Carnegie Mellon, like the competitive and selective institutions. And those, of course, are not the only higher ed institutions. But when companies are planning where they ought to go, particularly tech companies, they use those institutions as proxy for the availability of a modern workforce. So if we already know a priori that the system that we have completely and totally and structurally locks out certain sections of the population, and at the same time, we build an economic development strategy that's premised on the fact that we know that those students can't compete. We're building a future, we're building an idea of citizenship in a modern technopolis without them. So that means the mass migration out of technopolises, of technopoli, if you like, without the black population, the Latinx population, the poor population in rural communities, where those students, because of the structure in which they sit in their educational enclaves, cannot participate. And when we plan for and build an infrastructure to generate economic development in a technopolis, knowing that we're planning for a future without them. We have to be clear about what that means. And in the environment that we're currently in, which is why I began this discussion that I did in the way that I did, because we're in a social uprising here. We're contending with what it means to be an American citizen, to be viable, to have equal and human rights, to have your presence be acknowledged, respected, and cherished. And if in the specific, specific lane of dealing with technopoli, we're planning for futures without certain people, it conflates this other problem that we're contending with now. So as we go forward, our challenges are clear. These are things that uh, all of us are contending with and the individual decisions that we're making with our schools, with our companies, with our nonprofit organizations, et cetera. But access, resources, and philosophy. Access, obviously, is to the kind of education that makes you viable. The resources is the infrastructure that makes those educational enclaves uh, palatable, functional, to make sure that teachers are prepared. If you recall, in the last two years, there were about 11 states where the public school teachers across the country were on strike because of inadequate resources. And what does that all aggregate to? A philosophy. What is our philosophy about the utility of education in a democratic republic to make sure that all of the students have the wherewithal? They are all an integrated part of what a modern technopolis is. So I would charge us, uh, charge myself, with trying to consider what we do. And I think where we go from here, uh, because the country is in such a flux, our bias is towards making a quick act to try to bolster deficits that we can easily see. There aren't enough uh, devices. There aren't enough uh, students in communities with broadband connectivity. All of those things are important. But my argument is in the consideration of race and education, what we have to do here is that we have to contend with our philosophy. We're asking the educational, the public education infrastructure in the United States, which I would argue is one of the pillars of our democratic republic. What is it that we are choosing to invest in that such that we don't a priori decide that there are certain sets of students who have essentially no future irrespective of their own abilities, ambitions, and capabilities. They don't have a future in this country that we're trying to build, particularly one that is driven by a technopolis idea. So those are the charges that I think that we're up against. It's a moment for us all to consider the very best of the original American principles and a global sense of what it means to be human. Thank you much.